this is probably something a bit different to the other videos you've been watching, uh, the other presentations, because I've come from to Blender from a slightly different direction. Uh, no formal training in graphics animation tools at all. Uh, I'm an engineer by trade and fell into Blender because it was a really good tool for answering a few of the questions I had about design. Um, I'll, I'll share the screen and get, get started. Sure. Okay. Um, so the title is uh, Modeling for Manufacturing, Heavy Industry and Hobbies. And I've used Blender for possibly 17 years now. Um, and was using it extensively uh, in my design role in heavy engineering. Um, but we'll go through the slide and, and hopefully uh, cover all of that. Um, right, so as an introduction, as I say, I was uh, an engineer, been uh, working in heavy industry and then moved on into management and design and uh, other aspects of that. When I signed up to do a talk for the uh, London uh, user group, it was really a talk that I was going to talk about um, training and people learning Blender because over the years, my experience I had in 2003, um, oh, I just wanted to talk whether that had changed at all significantly because I know Blender has, but I struggled at first and um, it's sort of a, a pet topic of what can be done to make things easier for new users. Um, but instead of that, Kevin had seen uh, a feature that went on Blender Nation about an Austin Mini I'm rebuilding and I used Blender in that to create a, uh, a plan to be able to build a jig to turn the Mini upside down and do some work on it. But I'll put that to the end of the talk because it's not going to fill 25 minutes and instead um, talk about the work I was doing in uh, heavy architectural um, clayware and clay manufacturing. And I'll run through a, a, the process I used where Blender was used to do the visualization for an architect to win a job off him. And then that model was used to create the tooling a little bit later on in the, in the, the, the process of uh, producing the, the, the finished product, but we'll go through the slides and, uh, and I'll talk about that. I'll finish off then with the, uh, a quick, very quick look at the, the mini rotating jig because it's only a small hobby project I'm doing at home. And I'll incorporate some of the, the thoughts I have on training as I go along. Um, just so you can see, that's the mini rotating jig. Um, I've got a bodywork stripped down and now they've built the jig so I can turn it upside down because I'm too old to lie under cars welding anymore. But the bulk of the talk is about architectural terracotta and not many of you will have seen the sort of work that goes on with an architectural um, terracotta business it's quite niche now that picture is the law courts the victoria law courts in birmingham um, and it was quite a uh, popular time uh, around 1886 um, this was built in around that era there was lots of buildings going up over 100 200 years ago, um, buildings like the Natural History Museum and Parliament. Um, well, now they're becoming a little bit um, showing their age from mainly from lack of maintenance and needing repair. So when I was at uh, Red Bank working as the uh, technical manager, one of the more enjoyable jobs was working to do the repairs to architectural te terracotta. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see there's a tremendous amount of detail that goes in with artisan potters in the industry to recreate um, this sort of faience. Um, but large areas of the building are just the same product stacked up in lots of situations. And I'll go through a scenario of um, a hypothetical product rather than one that's built because COVID-19 stopped me um, contacting the company to go and get um, some of the designs I've done for them many years ago as I'm not working there now. Um, I uh, oh, just just go back a minute. At the time, um, it was all paperwork when I started engineering. There wasn't CAD available. Computers were uh, 
basically mainframes and uh, sort of desktop computers weren't available. So my early learning was on um, drawing boards, uh, trained as a machine tool engineer and worked through various different roles in foundries doing uh, design of uh, equipment, maintenance, and uh, just management of engineering teams before I moved to Red Bank in 1994 and took over their um, clay roof tile plant. A year later, I was moved to run their brick plant as both the engineer and production manager, um, which was a state-of-the-art plant making three million bricks a week. And I was doing alterations to improve the efficiency of the plant and found um, a program called KeyCAD, which was an extremely cheap program bought from ASDA. And that was my first foray into computer design. Uh, it's extremely basic and I quickly moved on to um, AutoCAD Lite, but was doing layouts of uh, machinery, uh, exhaust ventilations, ducting work that helped improve the running of the factory. Uh, a couple of years after that, I got moved up to take over as technical manager to run all of the technical aspects of the company, which was quite a big job because they had over 5,000 different product lines. Um, and a large part of that was supporting standards as well as doing the design of um, tooling and machinery for making new products and new product design. Um, move, with AutoCAD, it was okay, but I'd kept links with the machine tool industry and used to go to the shows and I'd been watching 3D CAD sort of develop and um, bought a seat of SolidWorks. 3D really improved the efficiency from when I moved into the technical department, they were still using drawing boards for all the machinery tooling and paper. And I could do a, uh, an extrusion die in a day that would have taken a week and a half to two weeks on paper. So it was a real advance and move forward for the company. Um, but I became frustrated um, to a degree um, with SolidWorks. I've trained to become an advanced user, but doing the type of faience terracotta for specials um, and that type of surfacing was almost impossible. I was looking around for an alternative. Um, and I was fortunate it was around the time when Blender was just released as open source. And I think my first version was 2.27. Um, that opened the doors for me in the sense that I could do visualizations. But first of all, when I downloaded the program, um, I looked at the screen and spent three evenings rotating the, uh, the default cube. Hadn't got a clue what mesh modeling was. It was completely different to um, any form of 3D CAD modeling. And it was quite frustrating, but I persevered. And after three days, I accidentally hit the tab key and found edit mode and was looking at different tutorials and gradually built up a, a bit of a knowledge of using it, but it wasn't uh, that organized a learning process for me at that stage. And then Blender 2.3 came out and I stumbled on the 2.3 guide, which I still own and I still refer to occasionally, which opened my eyes up to, to mesh modeling a lot more. Um, that really allowed me to start visualizing the products but it was still using the usual blender way of just roughly shaping a model to look like uh, the products um, that we made and then at some point i realized that you can actually place the vertices within blender with sub micron accuracy um, it was the real light bulb moment because i could then apply some of the cad techniques of um, like parametric solid modeling you sketch on a plane you can strain the sketch and then you either extrude it or cut that sketch away from other parts of the model. And that principle carried over to mesh modeling, but you didn't have a plane, you just had the viewport and uh, you set the plane with the level of the cursor back from the screen of the viewport. Um, but it meant you could build dimensionally accurate models that were far more accurate than any machine at the time could make. Um, you were sub micron accuracy with the placement of all the vertices in the model as long as you didn't use this um, subsurface um, subdivision surface modifier, which distorted the, the surface away from the vertices, um, the models were really accurate. Um, a typical CNC machine at the time was working to plus or minus three microns. Blender could go to a fraction of that in actually creating the model. And today's plastic filament uh, extruder 
printers are extruding to plus or minus 0.2 of an inch, 200 microns. So again, the models can be far more accurate than you can actually produce them as, a, as an actual product that comes out afterward. So the, the principle of applying the sketch on a plane extruding and became reasonably uh, easy for me to do coming from a CAD background and understanding Cartesian coordinates and things more associated with CAD than artistic 3D modeling. So I applied those to Blender um, and the visualizations of the models now done accurately were starting to win um, jobs with, with engineers and what have you. So on the back of what I'd learned and taught myself about applying CAD to it, I wrote the precision modeling guide. Uh, that was back in 2007, um, which I gave away freely from a website. It was received and extremely popular. It got shared on social media. And I think a day after I put it online, the server I was using for my website got took down the uh, it was a shared server and the company thought there was under a denial of service attack. There was that many downloads. It took that server down and I'd got the co company's uh, websites running alongside mine. It took the server down for three days. Luckily, they didn't throw me off, but I had to move the, uh, the precision modeling guide to another host so I could at least keep my website going. And the, the sort of products I've been making uh, when I was at Red Bank, uh, and where Blender was extremely influential was chimney systems and cladding systems initially. And these are some of the works done in Blender. The, the, the cover of the terracotta is a photograph, but nearly all the visualizations inside come out of Blender. All of the um, visualizations for the chimney systems, the, the designing of the chimney systems were done in Blender. And that design was only transferred to SolidWorks to get uh, a paper um, dimension drawing out so we could make the production tooling. Everything else was done in Blender. Um, but the thing I was most interested in as we spoke at the beginning was architectural terracotta. This is just a, a hypothetical scenario. We've done this on the works and some of the products. If you go back, if I go back to the other side, it, um, Red Bank was bought out by Forterra um, building products who have agreed for me to use the um, slides of, of their their brochures um, but they also do the architectural terracotta catalogues and various others um, so this scenario is basically where an architect had contacted us and wanted to have some coping stones made and I've just used the idea of a um, a hotel balcony um, so you'd have multiple balconies around and the shape of the coping stone I've, I've kept fairly simple just to go through the process of what was done in the design. Um, but because we've now got Blender rather than SolidWorks, which was a lot more difficult for some of the more complicated specials that we do, it meant we could send back um, a visualization to the architect. Normally the salesman would go back to the architect, plug in a, a, a 50 kilos or 25 kilos of uh, a terracotta block of something that was roughly similar to what the architect wanted and hopefully he'd come back and say we were competent enough as a company to make the product so for the salesman to be able to take a full visualization this is just a very simple representation of the sort of things we were doing um, but we go into a lot more detail meant they're almost certain to win the job um, again simple design as a as a blender model it's it's just a, an extrusion of a cutaway through the product um, the process to make it with extrusion you're probably all very familiar with because as children most of you will have hopefully played with play-doh and a play-doh extruder the the only difference is i was working in probably one of the biggest play-doh fun factories in the country um, and again because i haven't been able to have time to go around the factory which has been shut and go and take photographs of this type of machinery i've just roughed out um, a quick view of um, the, the size so you can get a scale of the, the equipment we were working with um, and basically the process would be uh, a conveyor feeds powdered clay into the top of the mixer which mixed the powdered clay added a little bit of water it would go through a vacuum chamber 
and be extruded out and the die would set the shape of whatever the product was. Um, the mixers are double shafted mixers and other uses for blender. I've done simulations, not so much for this, um, but you can, I've done simulations of smoke, um, how it's affected by different chimney terminals um, for the industry. Um, but uh, if I can just click on this, it's very easy to run simulations in Blender, as you all know, because you're all far more experienced and actually trained in the program rather than uh, a hobbyist that has just got more and more advanced. But just to show the principle of what happens in the mixer, um, the, the paddle shafts churn up the clay, water sprayed onto it a little bit to dampen it up. And as it's going around the two shafts, mix the clay absolutely thoroughly. You've got blue balls dropping in one side red on the other, but they're all completely mixed by the time they come out the other end and into the, the vacuum um, vacuum chamber, ready to be extruded. And all the magic of the process happens um, at the extruder end. And this is the, the sort of products that was made, a hollow section bricks, normal um, wire cut bricks would be extruded out as a long cut column and cut. Um, but inside of that, it's just basically a large worm screw that uh, pushes the clay through the tube. The, the die has a support mechanism to hold the cores and it pushes it out the front. So we've already got the shape of the product that we've sent in the visualization to the architect. And one of the key points when you're doing any sort of design work for something that's going to be made and remanufactured, I found was to mark the center of all of the circles and arcs. They can be refound with a little bit of maths or a little bit of uh, jiggery with the, the face, uh, extruding the faces along normals until you get the point where they all meet in the middle. But it's far easier if you actually mark the centers. And when you're rendering the product, um, if you mark the centers with just five vertices forming a cross, they don't actually show on the renders. Or if you just have a base model with that, it's an extremely useful tip for anybody looking to, to model um, actual products that will be manufactured. And building simple products like this was quite easy from a sort of CAD visualization perspective. It's not CAD, but it gives you the, the same accuracy. Is simply the placement of circles. You don't have to worry about arcs and arc lengths. You just place circles and marry them up with the specification of the architect's design and then remove um, all the unwanted vertices and merge all the ends together. Um, and you end up with a very accurate um, cross section of the product that's going to the architect. The only difference between the product and the extrusion die is the extrusion die needs the faces on the other side and where the product is it needs the holes so it's very easy to go from one to the other but if, if you're observing closely at the images you'll have seen one further change and that's with almost all manufacturing processes there's a, a shrinkage factor uh, if you're working on um, clay the shrinkage is quite high so the finished product that comes out of the kiln uh, has to lose a lot of moisture and in that all the particles pull closer together and it can be between 8 and 12 percent so that marking the centers means that you've not just got the product for the architect you've got the center marks for the product for the um, manufacturing layout so going from that um, to the uh, the drawing becomes a lot easier to mark out the, the vertices, uh, sorry, the dimensions of what needs to go to the machine shop. And again, it was very easy. Back in the times, 10 years ago, there was a script called Caliper, which made dimensioning very easy. And it was very um, adaptable to change the, the shapes of the, um, the arrows, the sizes of everything. We've now got a, um, an add-on called Measure It, which helps. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's been developed further as we go on. And some of the useful tools um, for designing and outputting a drawing um, are things that are 
in Blender at the moment as a standard one is uh, precision design tools add-on. And there's a potential for that project, and I'm, I'm hoping it goes that way to actually create uh, a window, which is the sort of paper view um, of the product that you draw in, which would give you all the facilities you need to output drawings for production. Um, the measure it script gives you the, the chance to put the dimensions on. And there's a, what, another one called measure it arch, which is the architectural uh, adaptation of that gives you even more functions of being able to place the dimensions on set um, so sort of X, X, Y or X, Z planes. So you line them up to be able to use them as an image. Um, and then a few other tools I've always found useful are things like TinyCAD and loop tools. Um, things that are really worth looking into if you are looking at modeling with a degree of precision. And in the precision modeling guide that I mentioned earlier, there's the um, opportunity, or I'd, I'd wrote up a method of actually printing to scale the, um, the drawings that you produce in Blender um, on that. Uh, things have changed recently and it's much more, um, it's a completely different program to when I started, but the underlying mechanics of 3D haven't changed that much, but the interface and the tools have become so much more advanced. Uh, it meant a complete new learning curve for me to learn Blender 2.8 because I was uh, illustrating all of the design documents and all of the technical manuals for the products I was producing. I decided rather than leaving it with um, just the precision modeling guide, I'd write another guide for Blender 2.8. Um, and I've recently launched or put on the market a book, um, Modeling Methods, Principles and Practice, which tries to give a structured approach to somebody coming to Blender so they can go through a process rather than rotating a cube for three days like I did. They can go through the process of actually having a structure that leads them through um, the various tools and techniques to, to do something um, physical on screen. And uh, hopefully it's been received reasonably well. Um, Moving on, uh, so I'm running a little bit short of time. The mini project, just very quickly. Um, that's the state of the mini when I received it. It was a friend of mine who'd had it sitting under a tree. I've done a number of projects rebuilding cars in the past. Um, this is the first one for about 15 years. Uh, received it, but decided I'm just too old to lie underneath the car welding. So I, uh, decided to design a jig to turn the car upside down rather than me lying down. And looked online and found a plan, a basic plan of an Austin uh, Mini that fitted my needs to do a rough model of the body shell. And it is extremely rough, but I was able to verify the accuracy of the model by going back to the mini body shell that I was stripping down and make sure all the measurement points that I needed to verify that the model would do what I wanted were correct within Blender's workspace. And the rotating jig was quite simple, um, just a, a tripod either end with a frame bolted to the Mini somewhere on its rotation point. And fortunately, when the Mini was originally built, they didn't have spraying equipment to paint them. So they built in a, the center of gravity a, a marker that they put jigs on in the factory. So it made it quite easy to pick up where I needed to set the jig to. And um, that's basically what I produced. Um, just to just go back to the beginning of this, but this is it in action when it was built. Uh, my my small workshop, um, and it the. The blender model made sure that everything would clear any supports that were put to uh, hold the uprights in place. The noise you can hear is the amount of rust and uh, particles, you can see them falling out at the end, but uh, it's extremely useful for home projects. When you're doing things yourself, you don't need to output blender to draw elaborate plans, but you can take the sizes of all the you know, cutting lists of all the components. If I just go back to the drawing. 
cutting lists of all the components and it does make little jobs that would be quite difficult to work out on uh, on paper very simple for you to transfer into actual physical parts that you're modeling and just as a quick update the that's the stage i'm at um, that was the floor as it was and um, that's the first floor in place and i'm just working on getting the uh, the metal work in now for the for the dual post um, that's it really for the presentation just a a couple of i'm running slightly over but just a couple of minutes um to finish off again on training uh, a, a few weeks back just before i was saw this talk coming up a friend of mine who I, I work with occasionally had asked what I thought would be a good software for his 14 year old daughter to learn 3D um, to produce architectural illustrations and product illustrations. I went through a list of things like the usual SketchUps and what have you, but said I use Blender and it's a, a really, um, it's a massive tool, but it's it's really good for the, the job once you've got an understanding of how to use it. I saw him a couple of weeks after and asked him how he got on. And he came back with the answer. Well, we loaded the program up and we spent an evening moving the 3D cube, closed the program. And he thought that was the end of it. So I'm gonna give him some training, uh, him and his daughter some training once the, the lockdown allows me to go around and, uh, and do that. But I thought it was ironic that 17 years have passed, so many advances have passed, but a lot of users who, who get sort of in awe of what's been produced with Blender, get frustrated within the first time of opening it and abandon it. And my sort of idea would be if the Blender Foundation could put a very simple wizard for new users, just that points to where the tools are that can drag things in the in object mode and where the tab key is, because that's the key to get people to start to understand they can actually change a model. Um, but it seemed, really ironic that 17 years on somebody was in exactly the same boat even though there's been so many advancement there's so much more literature on the internet but actually getting people to go and look for that literature you need to ignite the initial spark that they can actually do something in blender i don't know whether other people have got a similar view and if their background to blender comes from being totally unknowing of mesh modeling but really that's uh, the end of my presentation. I'll unshare my screen.